2000, maybe, or 2001. I was living in Baltimore at the time. I started the label in Baltimore, and Taka had gotten in touch with me, I want to say 2000 or 2001, and I was in a band called Sauna at the time uh, that he said he had bought records from, was a fan of, and had really liked the first Explosion of the Sky record that we had released. And he sent me their first record, which was called Under the Pipal Tree, and it had been released on Zodic, uh, which was John Zorn's label. And I really liked it. He had sent it saying they were going to make another record and they wanted to work with somebody, you know, uh, for the second record, which would become One Step More and You Die. And at the time, we were just, we meaning me, uh, was just too busy doing other stuff uh, to take on another artist at the time, especially somebody as active as they were because they wanted to tour a lot. And so we started communicating back and forth then, and uh, I helped him find somebody to release that record in the States. And then they did, and then he, I moved to Portland, Oregon in 2002, and he said, uh, you know, we're going to play, when we play Portland, we'd like to meet. So I booked them a, an in-store at Jackpot Records, which was a record store that I was working at in Portland at the time. And then we, we stayed, stayed at my house in Portland, and we went out for a breakfast the next morning, and just hung out and got to know each other. And it's the first time we'd ever talked in person. And I met all of them at the same time. And then in 2004, I was moving to New York. And they got, Taka got in touch and said, we want to make another record. And we know that you're busy and you might not want to put it out. But do you have any recommendations of who we could record with? Because we're, uh, we recorded the first record, their first two records they've recorded in Japan, and he said it's very expensive to record in Japan, and we're in the United States a lot, traveling and touring, so we'd really like to record in the United States. Who do you recommend we record with? And I had suggested Steve Albini because he had recorded all of the sauna records. And I said, I really liked working with Steve. I've always liked working with Steve. He's made a lot of great records from a lot of great friends. Uh, I don't think he would steer you wrong. I was contacted by Mono through uh, Jeremy Devine. And we have other friends in common. But they contacted me uh, through Jeremy about working on a record. And I, at the time, I was not familiar with Mono. The experience of working with Mono in the beginning was sort of like uh, strangers being introduced to each other and eventually becoming friends and eventually becoming familiar. So every time we work together it gets easier and more familiar and more comfortable. And now I, I feel like we can communicate almost silently. You know, uh, I understand a lot of things about Mono and Mono understands a lot of things about recording at Electrical. You know, he said the communication was really good and it was a lot of body language and a lot of just understanding about the way that their songs are created without having to articulate with words as much, which I really liked. And Taka wrote me and said, you know, this was an amazing experience. We'll probably record with Steve forever. Every time there's a, uh, every time I work on a new session with Mono, there is a, a, a little evolution in the underlying thinking in the band. Like in the beginning, there was a, just the, the initial uh, attempt to make a more grand or more romantic uh, version of rock music, like rock music that incorporated elements of classical music and elements of romantic music. Um, then when that initial experiment seems to work, then the, there's a, a, a little bit of growth. Like, okay, let's try even more, uh, of, of even more dramatic contrast between even quieter sounds and even louder sounds, or between even more aggressive rock sounds and even more sweet, more beautiful uh, orchestral sounds. And there, there is also a kind of a an experimental aspect where there can be a, a musical line that's written for an instrument that no one has ever heard. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, 
on one mono session there was Taka had written a part for an instrument called mm -hmm. the bass flute and, uh, and I'd never heard uh, never recorded a bass flute I'd never heard of a bass flute I didn't even know a bass flute existed and but Taka found this instrument somewhere and he wrote a part for it and in fact wrote a part for two bass flutes to be playing together and so I got to experience recording a, an instrument I'd never heard of, never didn't know anything about, and it was a kind of a surprise for everybody in the room, like, oh, I guess that's what it sounds like. I really like that, that attitude, that sort of commitment to the idea of doing something, even if the results are unknown, even if you don't know what's going to happen, mm -hmm. let's do it anyway, you know? I think that's a, 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 a very liberating way to think about your music. And so Taka had written and said, you know, we're not sure who's going to put out this record, but I would really like you to hear it to get your opinion on it. And it was amazing, you know, which was, it was Walking Cloud. And I really loved it. And I really wanted, immediately wanted to work with him to do it. And so that's when we started actually working together, like as a label and a band, but we had known each other for probably three years prior, three or four years prior to that. But that was the beginning of it. It was the beginning of the relationship with Steve, and it was the beginning of my relationship with them as a label, you know, as, as a company. And uh, it's nice, it's weird to think that that was almost 15 years ago, and that it's still the same.
We met Mono over 10 years ago here at Steve Albini's studio. Uh, uh, epic, epic guitars, epic drums, and I brought string players in. Best thing in the world is have the power and beauty of strings with the power of distorted guitar and drums. It's a beautiful blending. I love this. You all speak much better English now, but we still could communicate back then, So, because music is before language anyway. So we understood one of my early memories of Taco when he was trying to express what uh, he wanted us to play. And he said, two sisters are walking down a path, and the older sister is teaching the younger sister the song. So the younger sister doesn't quite have it. The older, and that's the feeling in the melody that we played that day. That's a beautiful way to express music. Every band, when it starts, has a, a, a fundamental set of ideas. Like a, a certain number of ideas are the reason that you start a band. Either you have an inspiration from a certain tradition, or you have uh, a conceptual basis for starting the band. So when the band begins, there are a few ideas. In most bands, those ideas are exhausted fairly quickly, and the band ends. If the idea itself is open, like the, the, the principle of the band is not rigid, but has an element of surprise or an element of, of experimentation, then the band has more longevity and the, the band can survive a long time. Mono's music in particular, you know, is sort of a, it exists in this ground between something like neoclassical uh, or, or just, you know, traditional classical music, Bach and Beethoven, their combination of it, you know, is something where there is, I think they're as interested and inspired by classical music as they are metal, you know, and, and dark experimental music, ambient experimental music. And that combination in and of itself isn't necessarily... You know, they're not the first band to, to do it, but they might be the best to do it. So, the basic idea of Mono has not really changed that much. You know, Taka is inspired to write music that has elements of beautiful and sad and aggressive and romantic. All of these elements are part of his creative impulse. And the band executes these ideas, and the, the basic idea hasn't really changed. But the colors used in the painting, even if you paint the same picture again and again, the, the, the colors can make a different picture every time. And I think that's the that's what, what any truly original band is doing. They have very deep ideas at their core, so they don't exhaust these ideas immediately. And that's the impression I get from Mono, is that the basic idea of the band hasn't changed. And that's true also of many of my favorite bands, and, and also some bands that are very long-lived, that last for a very long, long time. And I think with Mono, you listen, you listen to all the little melodies and then, and then respond. You don't just play. You, you listen and respond, relationship. Um, and I like the power, the power of Mono's music, because it gets so explosion, and then so personal and so beautiful. And I think this time, over the last 10 years, I don't know what everyone has gone through, but I feel that everyone has gone through some life. Like, I've gone through some life, you know. People I've loved have died, and people have been born, and so I feel that in Mono's music just in the music. No lyrics, but I feel that coming through. I just think they're an absolutely lovely band, a very original and unique band, creating this really, really incredible music that's just such a pleasure to listen to. That um, I honestly think it's music that if anyone who's a fan of music is able to enjoy this music, because it's, it's beautiful, um, and it's it just, it's 
also that's small and pretty and gigantic and enormous and it's, it's really so many things it's beyond description and I, I, I don't want to make I don't want to attempt to describe the, the beauty and the loveliness that is the band mono. They're one of those bands where they're not universal because they're instrumental. They're universal because their themes are themes that I think feel like they feel like the soundtrack to your life when you're hearing it. Sort of soundtracks to, to vital moments in someone's life, you know, or soundtrack, you know, something that makes your a, a very mundane task seem extraordinary. It, you know, it turns your commute into something that you relish. It, you know, and, and it serves it serves this very important purpose where it's, you know, like it's music that works profoundly well for times of crisis, um, times of joy, times of euphoria, you know, these these little moments where and we're all alone at some point every day, no matter what your job or your lifestyle or your your world is that you're in, we're all alone at some point. And a lot of the music that, that we release, mono especially, is is music that is profound when you're alone. We get emails and letters. I mean we get intense mail from people, you know, that ranges from you know, I graduated high school and I never thought that I would. And the first thing that I did when I graduated was I went on a road trip and I just listened to mono for a week. And then we get letters like, I was going to kill myself. And I listened to this religiously for a week. And then they played my town and I went to see them. And I did not kill myself. Instead, I wrote you the letter, let you know, thank you. The beauty of that in a live setting is then their shows fill with people who are used to listening to this in these very intense emotional environments. And I think it can be its own sort of version of, uh, of euphoria and, and camaraderie when you're in a room full of three or four or five thousand people that you realize, like, I don't know the person next to me, but if that person feels the way that I do about this music, then it makes me feel better about all of us.
seeing them live totally changed my perception of them because I live they they're one of the they're one of the most like viscerally dynamic and loud shows I've ever seen. It's always a different experience to see mono live in a club setting or in a rock band setting because the the records you can hear again and again and again and in incorporated into the music on the records is are all of these symphonic sounds, really beautiful sounds. It's symphonic. You know, it's they're the more than any other band of that kind, they're extremely orchestral without actually having strings on stage. You know, their records, eventually, their records grew to have a lot of strings and full orchestras in some situations. Live, they're still a four-piece rock band that somehow creates the same impact and the same emotional heft that they do on record with 30 players, but with only four people. And I have always been impressed at how, when you hear the rock band part, if you are familiar with the music, your brain kind of synthesizes the orchestral part while you're watching the band. So seeing mono live is very much like listening to the records, but with the sort of personal presentation of live. You know, seeing them live is a whole different world to me. Like it's, it, it's a way to appreciate their music as two different entities, one on record and one live. Uh, and I have heard some of these songs uh, live when Shellac, my band, Shellac, played with Mono in Japan. And I had not yet heard the orchestral uh, arrangement along with the, the music. And it was interesting to me that my brain still synthesized this beautiful sound underneath this noisy, aggressive, music it's almost like a, a psychological trick uh the more impressive thing to me about mono is that they've continued to do it for as long as they have and that it's still amazing to me you know i've seen that band probably a hundred times live in 15 years the last time i saw them which was last year was one of the best times i've ever seen them it's one of the best shows i've ever seen them play you know it's and it's harder as somebody playing that music, it's harder to maintain that kind of passion and energy in what you're playing that long into it. You know, they they tour constantly. They they play probably 100, 150 shows a year some years. You know, I, I would go see that band live right now and, and guarantee that it would be the top three best performances of mono that I've ever seen. Like, there's a... I'm almost certain the next time I see them is probably going to be as good as the time I saw them in 2004. You know, that's there's very few bands you can say that about.
I'm really, I'm really excited to play it for her when she's old enough to know what it is, you know, and, and be able to say, this is, like, the sound that you're hearing is, is your heartbeat from before you were born. It's an amazing feeling. <laughs> 